So hello everyone and welcome to another SEDS Online webinar. Um, we are really pleased to be able to offer these events for free thanks to funding from the International Association of Sedimentologists. So they, because of that funding, were able to not just offer this uh, resource, but we're able to offer a, a series of other resources as well, which you can find out more about on our website and I will tell you about at the end of this presentation as well. In terms of our membership, um, since last week we've gained about 300 members, so we're up to 917 members fast approaching the thousand mark, which is really amazing. Um, and uh, so we're, we're really pleased to be part of this large community um, of a huge range of expertise and, and knowledge, Matthias being one of them. Um, one of our members. So I, I'll just introduce our speaker for this week. So Matthias graduated from Gothenburg University with a degree in physical oceanography in 1999. He continued there to complete a PhD in physical oceanography in 2004. And after a year as a research associate, he moved to Bangor University for a Philip position as postdoctoral researcher in 2005. Then he received a NERC fellowship in 2008 and became a senior lecturer in physical oceanography in 2013. In 2016, he was promoted to Reader of Physical Oceanography in the School of Natural Sciences and has recently been promoted to Professor, so congratulations. Matthias uses models and observations to explore how tides interact with other components on the Earth, of the Earth's system, and in particular, how these, how, these interactions, how, how these interactions can change over long timescales. This is what Matthias is going to be talking to us about today, so without further ado, I'm going to hand over. Well, thank you very much, Catherine, for that introduction. And thank you, everyone, for joining us. This is a really strange situation, talking to a computer screen. Uh, I'll try and uh, be as clear as I can. And you might wonder what long-term changes in tides has to do with, um, with sedimentology. But there, there's going to be a plea for help at the end. And hopefully, there will be a clear reason for why. I think this is something that we should all be talking about. And uh, this is work that started with my fellowship and as you can see from this slide I've had a score of collaborators um, joining me over the past decade or so and I point them out now here so I don't forget it so I will forget about it later on but now you have seen who they are and where they are and there's a reason uh, why I like working with tides and it's because it allows you to time travel and we are going to go on a journey through time and see what the tides are made with and a great motivation if I can get it to change slide, there we go, is this fantastic animation we're going to see from Cara Matthews, who uh, did this as a PhD with the Earthbite group uh, at University of Sydney. Uh, this is Cara's PhD summarized in one minute and 18 seconds. And we start in 410 million years ago, you have the dates uh, up in the right hand corner, and it's going to go in steps of a million year to present day. And what you see are tectonic plates. And the ones outlined in brown is our, uh, continental is continental crust. The green outlines is present day coastlines. They're not necessarily the coastlines as we go through time. The blue lines are uh, mid-oceanic ridges, spreading zones. And the purple lines which have with the triangles are subduction zones where plates dip underneath each other. Now we're starting at 410, which is a really interesting time period in terms of the Earth system because it's, of course, this the Silurian Devo uh, Devonian transition, but it's also halfway between when fish started to develop lungs and when they developed limbs and started walking on land, which is a key evolutionary event. And we think that the tides might actually have something to do with that. Um, so I'm going to run through this and talk you through a few events, and then we're going to see what the tides uh, were doing throughout this. We start at 410. And as it goes, we approach the fish started walking on land. There's a mass extinction event coming up, but you can also see how the continents move around and they are starting to aggregate together. And at about 310, we formed Pangaea, which is the latest supercontinent. They're really starting to jig together. And there we go, Pangaea is sitting there, very meridional, north-south, almost pole to pole. Uh, and we're coming up to 252 with the great dying, the largest mass extinction event in Earth's history. Boom, there, that's happened. The dinosaurs start to evolve. But you can already see that we are starting to rift. North America is starting to split off, and soon Antarctica are going to split off, and the South Atlantic will start to open, the North Atlantic will start to open. 
Pangaea is no more. The dinosaurs are really starting to take uh, hold and other extinction events coming up. At 90 million years ago, we have enormous epicontinental seas coming up in the area here, very shallow, anoxic. Uh, India is soon going to break the speed limit for tectonic plates. There she blows, dinosaurs become extinct. We're in a greenhouse world that gets colder and as Australia separates from Antarctica, Antarctica becomes glaciated and we settle into this picture that we're used to seeing when we look at world maps. And there are a few things to point out at this. First of all, the continents are scattered. We're about halfway through supercontinent cycles, so when we go from aggregated continents to dispersed and back to aggregated continents. Uh, the ocean basins we have are very meridional. They go from pole to, from to pole to pole almost. And I'd like to point out, if you look over in Asia, that is incredibly fractured. This becomes important later on. And there are rifts going all the way from the Indian Ocean up into the Arctic. I'm going to come back to those because we're going to use those for one person. Now we know that the tides are largely controlled by the size and shape of ocean basins. So if you look at pictures like this, or at least if you're me, and you look at those, you see that if the continents and oceans have changed that much in time, how have the tides changed on geological timescales? That's kind of the overarching question here. Um, and there are several reasons really for why we are worried uh, about uh, that thing, these things. But we need to start with the kind of tides 101 to make sure that we're all really on the same page. Uh, that was my plan in case the animation kind of worked. Um, I could have talked you through uh, a few of the reconstructions instead. But we're going to have a, a brief introduction to tides. So in the equilibrium tide, the theory that Newton came up with basically, we have this situation and we're looking at the whole system from above, from the North Pole, looking down on the North Pole. We have the Earth and the Moon and the oceans. This is obviously not to scale. And because of gravitational attraction between the Earth and the Moon and the centrifugal force because of their joint rotation, we get these two tidal bulges, two blobs, one on each side, one pointing directly towards the Moon and one pointing away from it. And this rugby, in this rugby ball shaped ocean, the Earth is then spinning around. Um, and then, and this is the dominating lunar tide, the one I'm going to be talking about the most. Uh, and then we can set up the same system uh, with the sun, and the sun and the moon are then going to be working together. And the panel that came up there shows the uh, tide prediction for Clandidno, which is near where I am sitting. And you can see that on Sunday we had a tidal range of about six meters and tomorrow the tidal range is going to be only a few meters and we have this fortnightly variation the spring neap cycle and that comes about because of the beat between the sun and the moon so during spring tides on Sunday the sun and the moon were working together and tomorrow they're going to be working in opposite direction and this is a currently a fortnightly cycle the beat between the solar and the lunar tide as a fortnightly period and that may or may not be the case as we go back in times because day lengths change and the reason they change is because of the tide because we are not on an idealized planet a water world that is very deep with no continents we have continents and we have friction so as the tide, uh, as the Earth is spinning inside this rugby ball shaped ocean, it's actually dragging it ahead. It, it, the tidal bulge points ahead of the moon. We don't always have high tide immediately when the moon is directly overhead. Uh, but this friction means that the Earth's rotation rate is slowing down. So the days are getting longer and they're getting longer by about two milliseconds per century which doesn't sound like much, but if you go back to the, Eos, uh, to the Devonian 400 million years ago, you had 21 hours to a day and 400 days to a year or so. So it does matter on long time scales. And because of that change, this spring neap period may not necessarily be 14 days as you go back through time. But if the whole system is spinning down, it must also get bigger. That's conservation of angular momentum. The moon is receding away from Earth. Uh, and it has to do that. It's the same principle as an ice skater. They spin faster when they have their arms close to the body than uh, when they have their arms extracted. This is the same system, but backwards. Because it's slowing down, it must become bigger. 
and that recession rate of the moon is known to fractions of a millimeter because we've been laser ranging the moon for the past 50 years and it's 3.8 something four centimeters per year is the current recession rate and we have the Apollo missions to thank for that because they put these re uh, reflectors on the moon that are used in the laser ranging. The problem we're having is that with the current recession rate, the moon can't be more than 1.5 billion years old because it would be close, so close to the Earth 1.5 billion years ago that it would be torn apart by the Earth's gravitational pull. It's known as the Roche limit. Uh, the Apollo missions, of course, also brought moon rocks back and they date the moon to 4.5 billion years. So there's a slight discrepancy from the Apollo missions here, 1.5 billion years from the laser ranging, the current recession rate, or 4.5 billion years um, based on the geology. And you can argue that at least one of these two estimates must be wrong. The question is, is it both or which of them is it? That is the one. And that is one of the main motivations for this work, is this how old is the moon? Where was the moon throughout Earth's history? And I really recommend all of you to read this fantastic paper by the late Walter Monk uh, from 1968, where he, through energetic arguments, basically debunk the young moon capture hypothesis and argues that it must be uh, old. It's a brilliant paper. It's quite funny. I actually laughed out loud a couple of times when I read it, which is rare when you read academic papers. And I also challenge all of you to publish an introduction that is shorter and more to the point than the one here. 19 words, which basically said, we thought we solved the problem, but we hadn't. And now we have, hopefully. Solve it. So this is one motivation of looking through tides in Earth's history to constrain the age of the Earth-Moon system and the spin-down rate uh, of the Earth's gravitation. But the tides do a lot more. They pump, pump an enormous amount of energy into the ocean. The current total tidal dissipation rate is about three and a half terawatts, so that's 10 to the 12 watts. Uh, the Moon itself, the dominating lunar tide, pumps in about two and a half terawatts, about seventy percent of that, and that's the equivalent of about four million mass bars, energy equivalent of four million mass bars being pumped into the ocean every second. And that energy is freakishly important because it generates vertical mixing. It's really difficult to move things vertically in the ocean, but the tides and the wind provide an energy source for that. And a good analogy, I think, is if you have a cup of coffee, you dump sugar in it and don't do anything, you go and have some sugary mess at the bottom of the cup. Um, and if you put a spoon in and stir it, that sugary mess is going to be brought up throughout the cup and you're going to get a sweet cup of coffee. In the ocean, the spoon is the tide. The tides stir the ocean and pump cold water and nutrients and other substances from the depths of the ocean up to the surface. And that is how we sustain the climate controlling part of the ocean circulation, the overturning circulation, by bringing deep, cold, deep water back up to the surface and regulating climate. And it's also really key for supporting biological production and fisheries. This figure here shows the satellite image of chlorophyll from the European jet. That's the southern tip of Ireland, that's Lands End, the southwestern part of the UK. And what you see in this bright band between the 200 and 500 meter depth contours is high primary production. It's the equivalent of grass in the ocean. And if you have that, you have the high trophic levels and that's where uh, the fishing boats would go because the fish would be there. And that's because the tide here pump nutrients up to the surface layer and sustain production. So it's another reason to see how these processes have changed in time. And especially the climate regulating part of the ocean circulating circulation is really interesting because if we go back to the Eocene 55 million years ago, we had the greenhouse world, but it's a complicated system. The black line here shows from uh, south to north. This is the present day sea surface temperature and the yellow, the orange and blue lines show proxy data. And the orange lines show this very reduced meridional gradient 55 million years ago, where we had crocodiles and palm trees, but the present day latitudes are Svalbard, so we replaced the polar bears with crocodiles, basically. But coupled climate models really struggled to get these reduced meridional gradients, and you could do it by putting very high stratospheric clouds over the poles, there's no reason why they should be there, or you could mix the ocean more. There's no reason why the ocean should mix more. If you mix more, you can get this reduced temperature gradient. So there's another reason to go and look at this. 
And then we have this interesting situation about why fish started walking on land. So if you go back to 400 million years ago, we had plants and insects have already made the transition and we had these nice swampy marshlands and great critters that were about a meter long, so swimming around in this. And if there was a large tide, you went in on the tide and then you might be left in a rock pool or in a mangrove swamp as the tide went back out. But you just wait for the tide to come back. But if you had a large spring neap cycle, it's quite possible that the tide didn't come back and for some of the periods here, the spring neap period wasn't seven, 14 days as it is now, or seven days between spring and neap. It was up to three months. And if that's the case, you're going to be stuck on spring high tide in a swamp area and the tide isn't going to come back. And you're going to be swimming around in your own excrement, become food or run out of food at the end of it. And there's the theory but that if you had large appendages, you had fins that looked more like limbs, you could actually drag yourself or flip yourself back into the ocean. And there was an impetus in evolution there that larger limbs um, gave you benefit. And once you got onto land, you had a buffet waiting for you because there were already plants and other critters there. Now, I personally would not have moved onto land because this here is a fossilized scorpion that was about 60 centimeters long, but you know, there's something to chomp on if you wanted to. So maybe the tides were one of many processes that were important uh, for the transition of vertebrates onto land. And the tool I use is a dedicated numerical tidal model. It solves the tides in an ocean and that's what it does. It doesn't do anything else. So this is purely tidal here and I'm going to focus on the lunar tide uh, in this talk. So it requires some form of topography uh, and we use existing reconstructions from various sources to that. And then there are some other technical bits here. What is important is that we do a large number of sensitivity simulations because the further back we go, the more and more poorly constrained the bathymetries are, the reconstructions are. So we test by checking the parameter space. And at the end of the day, I'm going to have talked about two and a half uh, thousand simulations. And the rest is technical stuff. We can talk about that soon. There's no point running a model unless you know what it's doing. So of course we compare it to present day and we have two interesting test cases even for present day. This is a real bathymetry for present day control case. And on the right here you see a simplified bathymetry where we've taken the real bathymetry and removed information. So we have roughly the same information amount in the simplified bathymetry that we have in an Eocene simulation 50 million years ago. And that gives us an estimate of what the errors are because we don't have all the details in the bathymetry. And if we run those, we get something that looks like this. The pictures are going to look along these lines uh, throughout this. And we show amplitude. So the lunar tidal amplitude is going to saturate at two meters. So the range of four meter. And in the present day, that's the job. We have an error compared to observations of about 10 centimeters. We capture the largest 16 meter tide that you can't see in Bay of Fundy, 12 meter tide in Bristol Channel, and we get the structure of this one. In the simplified uh, bathymetry, the tides have lit up. It's more energetic, and there are reasons for that. We don't have enough topography in the deep ocean, so the tides in shallow water will become overly energetic. And the error here is larger, but importantly, for some of the other arguments later on, is that we overestimate the tides in our simplified bathymetry simulation until a certain degree. If you have a bathtub ocean that is no topography at all, you will underestimate the tides, but I will come back. So the model is doing its job, we know what it's doing, we know how well it does it, and we can move on and start to look at some of the interesting time slices. Now we've done uh, 47 deep time time slices in the first batch, I'm going to talk about five plus present day, and we can use, for example, Ron Blakey's deep time maps, this is the uh, Devonian 400 million years ago, that can be turned into a bathymetry that we can plug into the model, and we get something that looks like this in terms of amplitude. I apologize for the changing color scale here, we shouldn't really use the rainbows, I'm going to one that doesn't do the rain. And this 400 million year slice, like I said, is an interesting one, it was just before um, fish started walking on land if you want to and we're looking for large amplitudes and particularly a large spring neap cycle in the areas where we have early fossil records and we have that around here in Russia and the Baltic Delta Basin and we get large tides in the right location and there are some proxies some uh, laminations that show us that we get the right range compared to those. 
also over in what is now South China over here where lungs first probably developed we also get large tides which lend some support for this idea that tides may have been one of many processes that led to the evolution of terrestrial vertebrates. And then we jump 150 million years and end up at the peak of Pangaea during the Great Dying and the tides are doing nothing. This is the equilibrium tide basically, this is really quiescent. And the reason for that is that the ocean is too large. We can't host a large tide in a large ocean. It has to have the right size and shape. It needs to be resonant, just like an organ pipe or a guitar string or any instrument can be tuned to sound right. It's the same here. We must have the right size and shape to get a large tide. The tides didn't do anything. They were probably not a reason for the mass extinction event that happened. But at the same time, having a very, very weak time is not, the tide is not great because when you pump a lot of nutrients and pollutants into the ocean, if the tide isn't there to ventilate, it's not there to stir it, we're going to get um, bad conditions in the ocean. And that's what happened 95 million years ago during the Turonian marine extinction. In the center here, we have an enormous epicontinental sea. The tides in it are very, very weak. We had sea level rise, we had a warm climate, and we dumped a lot of volcanic material into, into the ocean that was just sitting there, not doing anything. It's the equivalent of the Baltic or the Black Sea or many fjords today. There was no exchange between the deeper part of the shelf seas and the upper part, and we have large regions with evidence of anoxia at this time, because the tides were doing very, very little. And then we move forward to the Eocene, down on the lower left, 55 million years ago, and it doesn't look like much. The tides are still not doing an awful lot. They do what they're doing in the right place. In the Pacific, we have relatively lo a lot of energy being pumped in, and that is just what we needed for that closure uh, of solving the uh, problem of the reduced meridional temperature gradient. And we get that situation here. So by getting the right tidal mixing in your model, we can simulate the correct climate. But then as we move forward to present day, the tides start to lit up and we get the situation that we are used to seeing with these relatively large tides. And if we look at the total amount of energy being pumped in by the tide, which is important for lunar recession and a whole host of other processes, it looks something like this. And there are a lot more simulations here than I've talked about with error bars from the sensitivity test. And the tide were relatively energetic 420, 440 million years ago, and then they went quiet. And especially during Pangaea, which is marked by the Dutch line, they were about 25% or so of what they are now. And if you want to vast pass per second instead, it's over on the right hand side here. And then they perked up a little bit, dropped out, and then they really blew up. We, I must admit that present day have actually fallen off. Present day is at one. This is relative to present day, so at 4 million miles past. And the blue star up here is the last glacial maximum. It's the most energetic of all the time slices um, we have found because the shelf seas were removed and resonant properties of the Atlantic allow for a very, very large tide. So the tides have changed a lot, and this uh, points towards the old moon hypothesis. For large periods of uh, history, at least the past 400 or so million years, 8% of uh, uh, history, the tides have been about half of what they are today. And that's great for that part of this. And, but the question is, we are currently about halfway into the supercontinent cycle. So if we move towards the new supercontinent in a few hundred million years, what will the tides be doing then? And the question is, who works on looking at tectonics um, over the next few hundred million years? And it turns out there are four plausible ideas for what will happen. And I am going to talk about one that comes from um, Joao Duarte at Instituto Don Luis in Lisbon. And he has one of the theories of how we may form uh, the next supercontinent. And we fortunately just had a paper a few weeks ago by Hannah Davies in Earth System Dynamics, where we look at the tides in all four of these scenarios forming a new supercontinent. And they, they agree, we get the kind of this, a similar picture in all of them. So we start a present day uh, with a slightly different setup and we move forward to the formation of Aurica. And this is an interesting scenario because we close both the Pacific and the Atlantic. And that's tempting from a geological perspective to avoid having really, really old sea floor at the end of the supercontinent cycle. We do that by rifting 
Asia through that rift that I pointed out in Chorus Animation that goes from India up to the Arctic. We form a Pan-Asian basin and the tides drop, light up, drop, light up and then finally as Orica formed we have again this very very weak tide and all the four scenarios have a similar setup. The tides come and go and at the end they are very very weak and if we add the dissipation from that Orica scenario to the previous timeline, it now looks like this. So we now have 600 something million, almost 700 million years of tides. But the interesting, really interesting thing here is that when we had supercontinents shown in this gray, the tides are weak. We can't have a large tide because the ocean basins are too large. And we call this the supertidal cycle. So associated with the supercontinent cycle is a supertidal cycle, but they're out of phase. When the continents are aggregated, the tides are weak. When the continents disperse, the tide has an opportunity to go through a series of resonances as the basins open and close, and then when the supercontinent come back together, they are weaker again. So this was a quite interesting finding, we thought, and this idea that continents control tides, and eventually then the continental configuration actually decides where the moon has been throughout Earth's history is a quite interesting notion, we think. But this is still a very short period of Earth's history. So what happened further back in time? And can we actually look at that? And we can, and there are a couple of different approaches. And I'm going to use a case study, which is the Cryogenian. And this is a really interesting period, 715 to 630 million years ago, when Earth was frozen. It was in a snowball or slush ball state. That is, it looks something like this uh, illustration down here, that either it was completely glaciated, all of it, that's the snowball, and that may start to give way more to the case we see here with an open ocean and maybe not ice sheets uh, around the equator, uh, the slush ball state. It was of course also no, nothing live on land before this, with just simple life in the oceans, and I like this picture up on the right here that illustrates what land that wasn't ice covered would have looked like. That's actually a picture from Venus, but it's similar in its lack of anything living on it. And tides and ice sheet have a really interesting interaction because the tides help melt ice. It's the underside of the floating ice in Antarctica and Greenland at the moment that are melting and the tides again by mixing support a melting process. And at the same time if you put lots of ice on top of the ocean the tides get dampened out. And the problem with the snowball state is that it's climatically stable. It's really tricky to get out of snowball. If you have a completely frozen earth and want to do it with CO2 alone, you need CO2 concentrations in order of uh, 120,000 ppm. And we've just gone past 400 ppm. So you need an awful amount of stuff. And maybe the tides may have helped then break up the ice and maybe served as another mechanism for this. Or the tides weren't doing anything because the ice was there. So it's a kind of geophysical who done it, who killed who. It turns out the ice won. So if we look at a, a few time slices throughout this, it looks like there is a lot of energy, energy on large tides in the ice-free part of the ocean during the snowball state. And there was, but we don't think really that it did much. And in between the integration, it was really, really uh, quiescent in the deglaciation. So we think that the ice sheet won. And I put a large red arrow down here at 630. That points to the Latina Formation in Australia, which is a great tidal proxy. Uh, and we get the right amplitude in that location. So we think that at least that time slice we're doing, we're doing something. And if we add from 750 million years ago to what we've done before and fill in a few gaps in between, we see that snowball earth was really, really, really quiet. So it's actually possible that the weak tides helped prolong the snowball together with a whole range of other processes. But we've now covered about a billion years of earth including into the future. And this is roughly 2,000 model simulations uh, together in this. And now we have two supercontinent cycles because snowball happened during Panosha Rodinia and another, the penultimate uh, supercontinent. And we can see again, low tides, perk up, low tides, perk up, and low tides. So the super tidal cycle really there during the supercontinent cycle. The disturbing thing is, if you plot this on the timeline of Earth's history since Earth formed 4.6 billion years ago, we covered a very, very small part of it. 
And there are reconstructions from Crisco T's going back to about 1.5 billion years, and we're working with those. So there's a small question mark in the box over here. And then there's a huge question mark as we go back. The oceans probably formed around 4 billion years or so. Tectonics kicked off about 3, 3.5 billion years ago. What were the tonics doing back then? And can we actually look at it? We don't have any reconstructions. We know early on that it was the equilibrium case. We can approximate that by just an ocean and nothing on it. But what happened in the other parts? Is there a way of doing it? And maybe there is, because we can take a statistical approach. And the statistical approach means doing lots of runs for some form of random configurations and see what the tides do just to constrain the dissipation. And I apologize in advance for showing you this because this is the ultimate procrastinator tool. This is the planet generator. You find it online, the link is down there. And you put either hit random or put in a seed, telephone number or date of birth or something, and it generates from a fractal expansion a topography. And that is student Ben Blackledge who took that, did that 120 times, turned it into a grayscale image, and turned it into a bathymetry and then run the tidal model for that to see what happened. And this is just about to go back in the last revisions, hopefully, to GRL. Uh, I do say enter this page at your own risk because it's really easy to get stuck and try and generate the funkiest uh, bathymetry in this. But what Ben came up with was something like this. And the picture here looks a little bit like target practice with a shotgun. Uh, let me talk you through it. We have log dissipation on the left scale, so terawatts, uh, and we have gigawatts down 10 to the 9. And on the x-axis is uh, a measure of how complicated the uh, topography is, or bathymetry is, how much land there is, is in the colors, uh, but on the x-axis is coastline length of ocean surface area. So it's a measure of how much coastline there is. So water world, uh, sits over here and dissipates a few gigawatts. Um, you see that we cover a quite vast parameter space and about three orders of magnitude in dissipation. So on Earth, or an Earth-like planet, the dissipation can, spend, uh, can span three orders of magnitude at least, uh, which is something not taken into account when we look at other planets. And we picked eight interesting uh, bathymetries just spanning the parameter space. And a really interesting thing, A up here, doesn't look like that, but there are three New Zealands in it, basically. But as soon as we hit even B or C, which has a few microcontinents, maybe what Earth looked like in the early Archean when continents started emerging, the dissipation has popped up almost an order of magnitude. And B is a factor of three or four, and C is an order of magnitude higher than in the equilibrium water world case. And a few of these are incredibly energetic, a lot more energetic than Earth is today. This is present day realistic Earth and these are simplified Earths where we just looked at bathtub like bathymetry. Um, this one here as in the other. So we can kind of constrain um, the dissipation in past and say that it was somewhere from between a water world up to realistically present day level, so maybe a little bit higher than that. So we have a curve that on average probably still sit at about a quarter for large periods of time, and there's still uncertainty here, but it's now arranged during the arcane and onwards to say that dissipation was from very low and uh, up to around present day levels, realistically looking at the parameter space. And then earlier back, when moon formed and when the ocean started formed, the dissipation must have been much, much higher. A couple of orders of magnitude temporarily larger than they are today. We know that from, from theory. So we can conclude really that there is the supertidal cycle associated with the supercontinent cycle. So if we stretch things, we can say that the history of continental configuration on Earth controls where the moon is. The size of the moon in the sky is set by tectonics, basically. The present day tides are incredibly energetic but the moon is still very old. And these tidal maxima only last a few million years before they drop back down. And they, because the basins change shape on orders of tens of millions of years. And the past tides can have changed uh, quite a lot. In this. So we've proven that the moon is old, but the recession rate can still be large. There's a, a phenomenon that has been, um, a paradox that has been solved. And there's a long to-do list. 
more on the deepest time slices, lim limit the tidal dissipation for the deep past of Earth even more. Uh, we use Earth as a proxy for Earth-like exoplanets. Uh, we are interested in regional high-resolution simulations to really nail down what is going on. And we want to link this to other Earth system processes, and especially climate, especially climate during Earth's early years. And I said that there was going to be a kind of plea, and here it is, and it's of course in the tidal proxies. When I started this work, the three of us on the planet who bothered about this, we said that there are no proxies for the tides. But of course there is. It's in the geology, it's in the sedimentary record, in tidalites and laminated sediments. And I want your help from the community, and I hope you agree to help me that this is interesting enough. Yeah. We need anything you have that contains the tidal signal from before the instrumental record. So please get in touch with me and share whatever paper you know and information you have. Assume that we have not seen it, I think is a, a good idea. And the plan is actually to build a tidal proxy database, and it's starting to take shape in the form of a spreadsheet with a bunch of tabs and a paper repository. Hopefully it can become more uh, later on, but we're starting to collate this because we really need to constrain our tidal simulations uh, as well, uh, so we really know what we are, are talking about. And when you talk to exoplanet people, they don't really care about bathymetry, but they kind of come back and say, no, are there any other random ones that we uh, could look at? And there's always Chicken World. I bet you didn't know that you can rearrange the continents on Earth today to make them look like a chicken. Technically, this is apparently not too harebrained, except Australia has gone up through Bering Strait and Greenland is moving south. And there's been a freakishly hard Brexit because the British Isle has been sheared off and are dumped here at the bottom of the world. But if you take this and look at the tides, they will look something like this. And on Ben's parameter space, they're actually quite energetic. Uh, they sit up at the top of it because we have a lot of basins that can host large tides. And when I showed this to the exo, my exoplanet colleagues, they went, well, you know, it's another interesting one. Are there any other ones? And of course there is the fire breathing T-Rex world with this tide. And then you have a whole host of other ones, polar bears and donkeys and hummingbirds and rats and things that we still need to look at. And of course these are jokey things, but they are interesting because you have the same amount of coastline length, but you can still get a range in tidal dissipation using present day continents on an Earth-like planet. And all this matters not just for us, but for the exoplanet community as well, and constraining tides on Earth is important to constrain tides on other planets. And I'm going to leave you with my favourite picture, this is a very, very small part of the sky. This is Hubble's ultra deep field picture. Happy birthday, Hubble. We celebrated 30 uh, not that long ago. Uh, and this cover, you can fit 32 million of these pictures onto the nighttime sky. It's the size of a tennis ball at 120 meters distance. Now, what you see are 5,000 objects, but they are galaxies. And you can see if you stare at it long enough that these are not stars, these are galaxies. And a galaxy on average contains about a billion stars. So you're looking at five trillion stars. And the latest estimate of the number of exoplanets in the Milky Way is that there are more planets than stars. So you're also possibly looking at about five trillion planets. And then you multiply that by 32 million, you get the number of planets in the observable part of the universe. And if we are going to look at habitability and finding planets that may host life, then we need to constrain the tides for those planets because the tides are important for orbital evolution of climate. And by having better constraints on an Earth-like planet, and Earth is a pretty good proxy for Earth-like planets, constraining tides on Earth are absolutely crucial for knowing where we are going to be hunting for planets. And we need the sediment to the record and the geological record to constrain our present day tidal simulations better. And that's all I have to say. I will stop sharing and I will um, take questions if there are any. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Matthias. That was really wonderful. And it's, I think it's amazing really to see how, how, how detailed we can get these pieces of the missing puzzle back into the rock record. And I, I do encourage everybody here as well to listen to Matthias's plea 
um, of, of help for putting together this, what sounds like an amazing uh, tidal database. Please do. And I believe the forum is opened and I'm going to subscribe to it and feel free to um, send any information you have my way. I, we really, really, really need it. Uh, the, I've we have a few, with, but they are incredibly useful. We need them. So, um, okay. um, I think you're breaking up a little bit there, but, but I, I think if there are any questions, I'd be more than happy to take. I'm not sure how you do. Do you hear or on the board? So, so anybody who has any questions, please um, put them into the chat. I can see we've already got a couple coming through. Um, and whilst Whilst you're typing them, I'll remind you that if you're watching this as a recording um, and if you think of a question later or if you don't get to ask a question today, there will be a thread in the forums um, for you to go and post that along with any of your title uh, papers to, to help out Matthias. So I'll just, we'll start going through some questions now. Okay, um, lots of thank yous, um, lots to think about, wow. Um, okay, so that was a really long question. In the snowball section, you mentioned the Elastina formation in your submitted paper, referring, I guess, to some classic rhythmites that were described by George Williams. My question to you in the community would be, um, why, um, yes. um, why are tidal lights so beautifully preserved at this one locality in the Flinders range and fail to appear in the record, convincingly at least, anywhere else? There may be some tidal deposits elsewhere in equivalent successions but to me, they are not obvious. Sorry for the long comment. There we go. Yes. Um, so why, why are they better preserved in some places than others, do you think? It's that one lo locality, but elsewhere, I don't know. There must have been larger tides, unless it's a very, very very small inlet, but it's possible that for some reason the geology wasn't preserved. Uh, it, it's it's interesting. What conditions do we need to actually get them? I I, I don't know the answer to that question actually. And of course, it is George Williams' uh, work from that. Um, yes, I don't know. Is the answer to be discovered? But, yes. Um, so we have another question from Arnud. Um, is tidal dissipation greater when the continents are configured around the equator as opposed to at the poles? Um, so is the tidal bulge higher around the equator than at the poles? It, yes, it is. In the equilibrium case, uh, the lunar forcing means that the main um, tidal bulge up and over the equator. In one of the simulations we had, we actually had equatorial continents in one of the uh, random ones and that killed off the tide because they covered too much. At the end of the day, it actually came down to the size of the basins. So today we have continents that run very much north-south and we have the largest tides in the North Atlantic. So it doesn't necessarily mean that we get the largest tide where we have where we put the energy in as such in the bulge. It is an interesting question with two polar continents, which we have in one of the future scenarios, the tide are very, very weak, but it depends on how close together uh, they get. Thank you. Um, we have another question saying, why not take the East African rifts into account in your projections for future Earths and tides? That's a very good question, uh, and it's something we've thought about. Uh, the scenario that I described, uh, it's ignored in that. It's included in one or two of the other ones. At the end of the day, it leads to a relatively small change in basin size, but you do open a new basin, and it is something we've thought about actually trying out as a regional uh, simulation and see what would happen when that basin opens up in the future, what would the tides be doing in that? It's an excellent suggestion, thank you. Great, um, and we have one last question uh, from Ray asking, um, is there any work relating tides and climate changes during the late Oligocene and the Miocene 
So have the oligomyosine isotope excursions been related to any of these tidal cycles? Uh, no, not yet, but it is work in progress. Um, so we, th that was one reason why we looked at the Miocene tides, um, was to link it, but the work hasn't uh, been done yet. It, it's something we are uh, keen on, on doing. On my wish list is to run the whole shebang, all hundred something time slices with the climate model, but I need to win the lottery first between we have a chance, chance of doing that. Ray's asking, um, as a follow-up question, are there any geochemical proxies that could be used? <laughs> it's quite possible there is. I don't know. And that's one reason why I'm asking for help. It, if there are geochemical proxies that can preserve some form of sea level or tidal signal, then absolutely. To some extent, well, I guess it could be done indirectly because some geochemical proxies can tell us about if a water column was stratified or not in shallow waters, and that is important. We can use that as a as a, a proxy for when we go from mixed to stratified in energetic shelf seas the geo geochemical proxies can possibly help with that Stephen suggesting um, biological proxies as well in, in yes systems and that is actually a whole different suggestion for proxies is to go and look at intertidal species because if you have an intertidal species then you must have a tidal intertidal zone and that could put another another uh, limit down yes we're ready to expect an email, so I think that's yes, helpful. please. <laughs> feel, feel free to continue the discussion in the forum also, um, so that we can all um, benefit from, from that very interesting discussion. Um, there's also there's a, a, a message here from Tim Demko with some data for you to, to look at as well. Yes, thank you, also. So, and um, there's a question about the LGM, I think we might have missed about the biology. Oh, the LGM. Uh, yes, it does have some of the largest types. Uh, I don't know, maybe it has um, implications for how the rock record has been interpreted. That uh, When you try and fit Milankovitch cycles, etc., to determine climate cycles in the in, in laminated sediments, you, the recession rate actually comes in because it controls the precession and then it becomes really important. And there are un some unfortunate examples that I'm not going to mention when they said, well, we can get a good climate uh, fit with the Milankovitch cycle using half or present day recession rate, and it should probably have been half and not the present day one. And it starts to become, become inf important there. Um, and then we have a, a, a last comment from, from Manu, um, and we will make this the last comment and any future comments, um, we'll, we'll keep this conversation going in the forums and I'll set that thread up imminently. Um, so Manu asks, so if I understood well, more tides are expected during ice house periods than greenhouse periods. I think we've lost you, Matthias. The wall was an ice house and the tides were doing nothing. But the LGM was in frozen, semi frozen, and the tides were the most energetic they've been. And that is solely down, basically. We have, uh, snowball was low because of the icy twigs. The LGM happened during. Uh, uh, happened during the scat where the past is the tides have been more energetic during the glaciations than they have during the interglacial. Yes. Fantastic. Well, thank you everyone um, for, for hanging on to the end of the questions. Um, and I hope that you found this talk as exciting as, as I did. Um, and the, thank you for some excellent questions as well here too. So just to um, do the classic um, session of giving you a few notifications. Um, as we've said, go to the forums, any further uh, information and to share any information about, about tides as well. Um, remember that we have other resources available on our website. So please go and check out our teaching library, go and look at, um, join us for our coffee breaks. Um, we've, we've been really enjoying them in all three time zones now for a little over a week. Um, and please sign up for the Carbonate Forum if you're interested. The Carbonate Forum 2020 has already got 200 signups and we only made it live 
on Thursday last week. So if you want to come along to that, go and um, go and put your name in uh, your name for it. So next week, um, our talk is going to be the first of our instructional webinar series, and it's uh, it's what you voted for um, because we had the the survey go around a couple of weeks ago. And it's going to be a CD workshop in kind of a Q&A format um, given, delivered to us from Tracy Frank. So we're really looking forward to that um, set online community. So share, um, share the, the word, as it were, with um, any early career um, people who you think might benefit from, from that talk at this stage. But I think with that, we'll wrap up and thank Matthias for his talk and um, hope to see you all at a future event. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. Thank you. Thank you.